Thank you very much, Margaret. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks for coming out tonight. I'm glad we beat the rain. As she said, my name is Alan Dines. You probably don't know the name, but I guarantee if you've lived in Boston for the last 30 years, you've either been in front of my camera or you've seen my work in the, any one of the papers. I've been in every Boston paper, including the small ones. Um, a lot in the Globe, a lot in the Herald, a lot in, um, in uh, Improper Bostonian, Boston Common Magazine. Those have been kind of staples for me for both event and celebrity. So it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, I'm going to start by not starting at the very beginning. You don't need to know how I got my first camera. You could always read about that. What I find is people like seeing the celebrities. And I hope you saw some faces in that that you recognized. Um, I think we, we, we kind of go both, both ways on that. Um, but I do want to start out with, with my disclaimer, and I, I do this at each event. There you go. And then this is the second disclaimer, and I don't remember what I was going to put there, so I just kind of left it blank. I don't really mean that my memory stinks. It really doesn't. I've got a really good memory and, and a really good memory for faces and names. Uh, but there are a lot of them, and sometimes they, they kind of get lost and hard to find, but not, not too bad. Um, and, and there are a lot, in, in, in a way, like my, my negatives. The most, most of what you'll see tonight, um, even though they've been digitized, are from negatives. These are negative files, and film deteriorates. Come on in. <laughs> film deteriorates. So um, I had to do this. I had to start saving these photos because whatever I don't save now, is not going to be available down the road. And some of these images were, were so rough that, that I spent hours um, photoshopping. But I, I'm not going to bother with that. I'm going to show you what they looked like. So the beginning is I was an amateur. I had a camera. I had learned how to take pictures. I was 30 years old. I came to it very late. But I also really enjoyed celebrity. And, and for me, celebrity at the time was the news people. It was channels 4, 5, 7, 38, 56. I listened to WBZ, I listened to all these people, and I loved, I loved that, that celebrity part of it that's a local celebrity. So the first thing I did was I, I, I wangled my way into something that was called the eyeball, and you could see the date, June 11th, 1992. That's when my career started. Um, I went there that night because the woman whose character is here by Paul Zepp from uh, the paper, from the, uh, from the Herald, um, is Norman Nathan and Norman Nathan did the gossip column that I read all the time and she had died and they were having a fundraiser um, her daughter and her husband Norm so yeah it was Norm and Norman Nathan and Norm was on TV and so these are the very first shots that I ever took and they were they were so um, deteriorated I really spent a lot of time but I also left them in a way that you'll see how bad they were so um, you might recognize Mary Richardson on the left from Chronicle, Channel 5. That's Victoria or Vicki Block on the right. Here you have Liz Walker prior to being Reverend Liz Walker. And um, one of my favorites from, from back then and for a long time is Bob Lobel. And you can see the shape of the, well maybe if we, uh, oh, let's go back. Oh sure, and once I messed around with them, let's uh, I don't know why we're not going back. I'm going to try reloading this. Sorry about that folks, I think we won't zoom in again. So let's reset that. I'm sorry about that. No well you're not going anywhere, <laughs> neither am I, so <laughs> we should be okay. There we go. And we'll just reset. All right. Take two, <laughs> Liz Walker. We lost, apparently we lost Bob Lobel at the event, but I put this right in with it because everybody that I wanted to work with at that time, all these news people, I got to work with all of them for 30 years. I, I've, I've been at the Channel 25, 25th celebration. This is the closing of the garden. And here you have Bob Lobel, who is the MC with Red Hour back, Kuzi, um, you have Havlicek, Har uh, Harry Sinden, uh, sorry, uh, uh, to yeah, no, Tommy Heinsohn. And I really, I was hoping Bob was going to be here tonight. He said he might show up because 
You see him back here? I really want to know what he was thinking with all these greats in front of him. So he was the master ceremony. This is the closing of the garden. And there he is in the back. And this is what it used to look like. If you remember that place, it was one of a kind. Um, the rats had as much rights there as anybody else did, as far as I remember. <laughs> so the garden closed on one night, and the Fleet Center opened the next night. It was a two-night event. And the second night, James Taylor played, and that's the first time I saw James. And Patty LaBelle was with him as well that night. And that was just absolutely a blast. So now getting back to how I started, this is Norm Nathan. You can see he's being interviewed. And it's this shot that ran in a paper called The Jewish Advocate. And that's where I got my start. That was, that was the first place for me. And they immediately started using me to do things that were happening right at the time. So as soon as I was there, weeks after this, Hillary Clinton was in town. It was 92. And Bill was coming to town a week later. And there he is. And then two weeks after that, George Bush came to town, the HW. So he came to town. So within three weeks, I'm starting to meet all these like really big celebrities, uh, meet them, photograph them. And through the Jewish Advocate, I was able to get on the set, which was right on Beacon Street, the when uh, Cheers did their last, their last show out of Boston. And you can't see in this photo, but right behind Kelsey Grammer here, there is a... Uh, there's a guy, yeah, there's a guy with a tether holding him from behind, and he's grabbing the window, holding on for dear life. And then down at the bottom, you see Ted Danson and, and Cliff, Cliff Clavin, John Ratzenberger. That led to me going and using those photos. I was really good at sales. So whenever I had a name, I just added it to the list of the names that I would say to the next person. So at this point, I'm shooting for the Jewish Advocate. I say, I've been with the president and, and with Hillary and Bill. And I approached WZLX, who was having this show. And that turned out to be the stepping stone that I needed to get to my next like big break. But the best thing that happened at the ZLX being, it was at the Hat Shell. It's my first time wearing a laminate and having all access at a concert, which was really exciting. I was looking forward to that. I had access, so I went to the front of the stage, and I talk about this first time ever. I went to the front of the stage, and I waved at a crowd of people, and that's the response. It was about 15,000 people at the time. There was nobody else on the stage because they hadn't set up for the band yet, so I took full advantage. And I'm sure you'll all notice that that skyline doesn't look like that anymore either. That's very different. So now, the band, um, the band, played there, so LaVon Helm was there, and they did, they did a late set, Roger McGuinn was there, but what really was important to me was, was this shot. This was meeting the House of Blues All-Stars. The House of Blues had opened recently, and it was a great place. I was there through the Jewish Advocate, I was at the opening of the House of Blues, and fell in love with this house. Has anybody been there? Did anybody go to the original House of Blues in Cambridge? It was a wonderful, wonderful venue, and it was on fire for, for many, many years. So at this event, I met a person, that, uh, an executive from the House of Blues who asked me if I would send him photos of the House of Blues All-Stars. And I was smart enough to know that I didn't want to just put them in the mail. That would be the end of that. So I, I told him I would be happy to share my photos, but I want to come out and meet you. So I went to the House of Blues the following week. And three days later, I was hired by the House of Blues so this is a week from the be-in. Be a week later, I was at the House of Blues, and that started a three and a half year stint with them. This is the, the original house and the original door, and I think the stairs were that crooked to begin with, too. So some of the shows at the House of Blues were amazing, aside from the fact that they really had a lot of blues. They also brought in acts that were just incredible. So, if you don't recognize him, this is Clarence Clemens from Bruce Springsteen's East Street Band. That was a wonderful show. That was just fabulous. Boston played there, and this is um, Brad Delp. And we all know that, that he, uh, he commits suicide, unfortunately. One of the best voices I ever heard. This was a really awesome night. You have Chris Layton right here from Double Trouble, Stevie Ray Vaughan's band. Then you have 
Eric Burden of the Animals, Robbie Krieger of the Doors, and Little Milton, who's a 30-year blues musician. I think you have about 150 years of music in that room. And the sets, they did a couple of sets, and it was just fabulous. When the House of Blues was really hopping, it really hopped. The, the, the music was on the second floor, and it was wood floors, and the boards would bounce. So when, when, when a band got the place going, the whole house shook. Uh, anybody recognize this person? He's pretty famous. This is John Entwistle of The Who. And um, he was in town for Zach Starkey, Ringo son, who was playing. But Peter Simon, yep, that, <laughs> or sorry, Townsend. Um, this is uh, Pete Townsend's son. And um, John Entwistle was like an uncle to him. So they, they were close enough that he, <laughs> he would do this and they let me photograph it. So I said, thank you very much. I tell you who this is, but it's pretty self-explanatory. Lou Rawls did a couple of uh, Sunday brunches at the house, which is something that they were very well known for. And for me, when I went to the House of Blues, first thing I did was I checked in with the guy at the door. His name was Chris, and he knew everything going on. He, had a, he was walkie-talkie to the ear, and he was standing outside, so we would talk. He'd tell me when celebrities were coming and going, and whether they were upstairs, downstairs, and when to be ready. This was a weird pairing. This is um, Alan Sir Jr., the race car driver, and Brad Whitford from Aerosmith. Just hanging out. And these guys, just, just regular chit-chat like everybody else. I put this photo in here because the House of Blues was also challenging. This was about a 60, 70 person shot. First time I had ever shot a number like that. And I was terrified. I was, my knees were knocking, I was still, you know, considered a rookie photographer, I brought every light in the house that I had and I think a couple of flashlights too. But it worked out well enough that I did uh, a few more years for them like that. The story about Blues After Hours, this, this is intertwined with the House of Blues and I share this because for three and a half years it was my favorite thing in the world. Um, there was a show called Blues a After Hours on WGBH and that was run by Mae Kramer. I don't know if anybody listened to her. But it was the only blue show and certainly the most popular. And, and May was really, really well known, liked and knew her blues. And the procedure would be on a Friday or Saturday night. And we did this dozens and dozens of times. Teo, this gentleman here, was the booking agent for the House of Blues. He would call me and say, we're meeting at WGBH um, with the talent. So he would have to call to security because it was usually 9 9.30 at night, something like that, doors are locked. And I just like this shot because of the payphone. Um, I, I still haven't figured out if it was 10 cents or 25 cents, but that would tell you the year. So there's Tails. So we'd go in. This is her studio. And these are the actual negatives. You can see that I had taken, you know, this is just shot right from the roll. So this is Mae Kramer. This is Roscoe Gordon, who was the talent that night at the House of Blues, and Teo and myself. In between takes with May, they would talk, she'd play some of his music, ask questions about other people in the band, and I'd get to know the musician and get some, some really nice portraits with them. So they're getting to know me, and we're there for maybe 45 minutes or so, and May play, you can see the time is 9.30. And then just before we left, we typically would do, do a group photo, and then we'd all make our way, except for May, we'd make our way back to the House of Blues. Roscoe would go to the green room, I'd take a few shots up there, then about half an hour later, he'd head up to the stage. These are the back stairwells. And then here he is on stage. And then that's really when my job really started. I've already done my photos, but whether they needed them for press or just for, for um, their own use, I turned them around pretty quick. So it meant getting into the dark room. And this is what was really fun. I would finish the show at night, having listened to him and May's show, do, do his show at the House of Blues. And then I'd go into the dark room and I'd put on May Kramer and listen to the blues and she would typically play his music. And as his, his this, is, this is the contact sheet coming up in the trays and I've got his music coming through the speakers at 1, 1 1.30 in the morning. Well, one, May was on to one. So up until one it was May and she would close with his music. It was surreal and it happened time and time and time again. 
whoever I had just seen would be on radio. So that's what I would play. The nights were great, just fabulous. The House of Blues allowed me to get into the Globe and the Herald, which back then was really important. And I have, um, I have some, of the, uh, some of the stuff that ran here if you want to check it out once we're done. But the Globe and Herald really made my career in Boston possible. Um, they would fight over photos. There was the inside track in the Herald and there was names and faces in the Globe. And depending on what the shot was, it was either a Globe shot or it was a trashy Herald shot. And that would determine where it went unless the client had a specific need. So this is, um, you can see it's uh, Steven Tyler and Billy Idol. The funny thing is, is that that shot included Tom Hamilton and a bunch of other celebrities as well, but that, that's what they used. This is one from, this is again, the House of Blues really helped me out. So Ed Bradley in the center here came in to see his two friends, Bernard Purdy and Solomon Burke. And that, this is up in the green room. It had a slanted roof. You could see it's very tight. But the thing that, that I liked about the Globe and the Herald, other than trying to figure out who was going to use the shot, was that it meant money to me. If I got into the Herald, it meant usually about $750 within a day. So people and clients and prospective clients see my name, they saw the photo, and back then it was a single photo, usually a five by seven. You could see the size of them. One photo on the page. So if you got that photo, that, that was seen by a lot of people. In the Herald it was seen by less, in the Globe it was seen by more, and if I had a hit in the Globe, a Globe hit would be about $1,000 within a couple of days just from, from a job coming up. This is an early one. This is uh, Tom Brady when he was a rookie. He, it was his first year there, and this is the start of Paul Pierce from the Celtics, the Truth Fund, which is still going strong to this day, so it's about 20 years. Here you have Candy O'Terry from uh, Magic 106, as you see there, and Don Kelly, who is the GM, with Rod Stewart um, for the birthday. This was, this was a quick shot. Sometimes it was very fast. You put down the cake, you're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting. The celebrity walks in, they chit chat for about two minutes, they do the photo, and then he's gone. He's up to the stage, and we're taking the cake up the side. This one is Rick Fox, who is with the Celtics, and here you have the owner of the palace. And he had just brought back a new concept to the palace, which was a bubble machine. So they said, do something with bubbles. This, again, was for press. It was all about getting a shot in, in, the, Glo in the Globe or the Herald. They didn't care that I was there for half an hour or whatever. So here's the shot that ran. So I made my money with the palace. And then because of this, say, another 750 or so, it, was, it, it worked very well. I'd like to move, uh, move on to the section that I call people I never thought I would meet. And I thought about this like looking back over 30 years as I'm putting these together. People that I met, and I certainly met many of them, but just some I didn't think I would cross paths with. Do, do you know the, who this is, Hans, anybody? I'll help you out. I'm sure you do because you eat his food probably weekly. That's Frank Perdue. The, or, the, original, the original chicken guy, and he was on TV a lot back then, which is why you probably recognize him. I never thought I would meet Frank Perdue yeah. when I was growing up. I just never saw I thought I would meet. This is absolutely, who said that? Lee Iacocca. So now, I never thought I would meet him until I started working for the mass auto dealers. And I worked for the Mass Auto Dealers for a few years, but I never met him through the Mass Auto Dealers. He was in town to speak to a diabetes group. So that, that's why, again, just the two of them together, just I wasn't ready for that. Chris Everett, the tennis star. She was fabulous, by the way. You know, I never had a really bad day with anybody. I'm supposed to be there. They're supposed to be photographed. They need their photos to be seen. So for me, it always worked out. I was never paparazzi. I never hid, hid out in anybody's bushes or, yeah, I made some people mad, but I never hid in anybody's bushes. So that's Chris Everett. She was um, volunteering her time at a, at a women's lunch place. She was great with them. Now, I did think I would re meet Richard Branson, but I did not think that I would meet Richard Branson in drag. 
Um, I, I read a little bit about him. This is already well into it, but the first time he ever wore drag, he lost a bet to, uh, to a friend, and, and he served as a cocktail, uh, as, as, a, um, as a hostess on the plane. And, and I think he got to like it over time, though. And if you see over here, this person right here and the one that's hiding in the back, they're from Hasty Pudding. They were, the, uh, they were Hasty Pudding that year. So he came out like this. He was on the plane. This came in. It was Virgin's, um, Virgin Atlantic's um, original flight to Boston. There's usually a party, and this is, this is the way he was greeted at Logan. Now this guy, you may recognize him, but you'd have to, you'd have to think back a little bit. This is Vidal Sassoon. And he was in town to support his son who was opening a, uh, um, a, a hair school. But the problem is he had sold the name and the family could not use the name Sassoon anymore. But he still shows up and the face is all the recognition he needed. He was wonderful. Somebody I never thought I would meet. You have Paul Bearer and The Undertaker. And you can see this was WWF at the time, now WWE. But the, the, this gentleman right here has actually been on TV recently because they were doing a new series and he was one of the celebrities. I never thought I would meet people from WWF. This person I certainly never expected to meet. This is the Dalai Lama and he came to Brandeis University years ago and there was so much press that they had to bring us in in groups. It was a small room. He was standing with, with um, his, his entourage at one end of the room. There was a space between us and they brought in about seven or eight uh, photo and video cameras at the same time and we rotated in and out. And, and you know, maybe it's just what goes on in your head, but there was a palpable energy in that room. Whether it was from us creating it or him or just what we're thinking about, it was palpable. You, you did know that something interesting was, was there. And this is Nelson Mandela. This was shot um, in the VIP section at Bill Clinton's inauguration in Washington, which I got to again from because of working with, with the Jewish Advocate. I covered, um, I was there for about two days, covered parties um, and anything that was associated with Boston. Um, this just happened to be one of the shot, shots. And about three seats away was Jack Nicholson, which I thought was very interesting. So now we're gonna go the opposite direction. These are people that um, either I did or did not think I would meet, but that I was, I was just so glad to be there. And I really didn't get nervous shooting. I'd been doing this too long, but I also started as a 30-year-old photographer. I was not, not a young, young guy when I started, but it allowed me to, to talk to clients and PR people very differently. They weren't talking to you know, young kids starting out. When they saw me, even though I was a rookie, they assumed that I had the skills to do the job. And I did later in life, but I, I faked it pretty well. I was a good editor. So this is at the House of Blues up in the green room. This is Brendan Fraser. Um, I was a big fan of the mummy. So he's doing his mummy pose for me, which was, which was really nice. I'm not sure why the clarinet was there, but he was in town um, with Patrick Dempsey and Moira Kelly, they were shooting uh, with honors at Harvard University. And they did the rap party at the House of Blues and I was lucky enough to be able to cover that. Here you have Julia Child. She was wonderful. I worked with her numerous times and she was, she was just so kind and so chill, just really, really fun. One of my favorites, this is Red Skelton, the comedian. Wonderful guy, and what he used to do is, um, this was at the Wang Center and he'd walk out, you know, very quietly, he's an older guy and he walked out and he had a little point and shoot and he'd hold it up and he'd look at the audience and he'd say, all mic'd up and he says, if you don't mind, I'm gonna take a picture of you because I like to show Mrs. Skelton where I've been. And he took a picture of, uh, took a picture of the audience. Another great comedian, this is Mel Brooks. This is a press junket as well for the producers. And he had a room full of seasoned Boston professionals losing it, laughing within five minutes. Just hilarious. This is pretty recent. Uh, this is at, at the, uh, the Centrum. 
I was there with a good friend, Chachi Lopret, who's on radio, probably some of you know him. And uh, I was his photographer with Ringo, which was great. That was, that was a lot of fun. To, to say I met a Beatle, like to be with a Beatle, I, I, 64, I was five years old, and I remember them coming to, coming to the States. So I was in Canada, but I saw Ed Sullivan. What else? A goat. I didn't know goats looked like this, but this is the goat. And he's, I love this guy. I think he is, he's wonderful. He's genuine. I don't know if he's changed or not, but I enjoyed this so much. He was here for Uggs and everybody that came in. So there were reporters that came in. They had 15, 20 minutes. We would do shots together. He would sign stuff. He was there all day and he never lost that smile or, or the, the kindness that he showed the, the reporters coming in that are all very eager to meet him. And, and this is one of my favorite shots of all time. It's not my best shot, but it's my favorite. Um, you saw the shot of, of uh, James Taylor earlier. Uh, this was a, a listener event at WMJX. And before the listeners were allowed in, he went in to do um, a sound check with the, with the um, engineer. So he went into the studio and I went into the studio and I looked around, it's just me and James Taylor. James, you hear me say, it was James Taylor. I never knew it was possible, I say it in the book, for my knees to knock while I'm sitting on the ground. But I was literally four feet away from him as he starts playing, I think it was Caroline in my mind, something like that. And it was, it was just so much fun to be in that room with him. And then the listeners came in um, and he played, he talked with them, it was a great time. And what I leads into kind of is, yeah, sometimes I got involved in the shot too. Look a little bit different, but I, I wasn't passing up this opportunity. At 12 years old, I was slow dancing to James Taylor. So that was a dream. So just to share some of the people that really, if I took a picture with them, it's because it meant something to me. So this is Eddie Van Halen. Um, very sorry to see him pass within the last year or so. And uh, the funny thing about this photo, this is done at the Hard Rock, and I love the photo, but I'll show you the rest of the photo, as they say. <laughs> this is the whole photo. I don't know if you recognize him, but that's Gary Sharon, who, who filled in, you know, when, when uh, David Lee Roth was not seen with the band, Gary Sharon. So he's from Boston, and he was ducking out of the photo, which I think is hysterical. Anybody recognize this lady? You got it. This is Carol Channing, and yes, you might be surprised that I was so thrilled to take this picture, but I love theater and I love music, and I, I did theater as a kid, and her name was synonymous with theater to me. Um, so I was, I was thrilled to be in this one. This is, again was at Brandeis University. Within two weeks of the Dalai Lama, very uh, different, different uh, events. Greg Brady, Barry Williams from the uh, Brady Bunch. He did, it, he did an oldie show, which one of my favorite clients was, was oldies. Now this is Olivia Newton-John. This is backstage at KISS concert. And there were about a dozen people back there, including um, Vonda Shepard, who did the soundtrack for Ally McBeal. Um, tons of people, and I forget his name, but I know that this guy is a band member and as well as this guy. But Olivia was wonderful. She was so much fun to be around and great personality. Now he could be in, he could be in two different places. He could be in somebody that I thought I would never meet and somebody I was happy to meet. This is Father Guido Sarducci from Saturday Night Live. And he was at the Comedy Connection in Boston. And like I said, somebody I never thought I would meet, but I, I really was happy to meet him as well. What's that? <laughs> All the stories, right? So this is, this is Bo Derek, and you can tell it's Bo Derek because you can see the way I'm standing really tall and really holding in my breath. Um, I would rate the event as a 10. <laughs> Very good, we got that. She, she was there for E! Entertainment um, with Jules Asner, who is Ed Asner's daughter. She was there too. And this is Peterman from Seinfeld, John O'Hurley. And the reason <laughs> this shot was so important to me is because I got my first free phone 
and my phone number because of this man. He had no idea that I, I got it because of him, but it was um, 98, and this was the marathon. So literally it was um, two days before the marathon, so pretty close to where we are right now. And the manager of the tent for, for Nextel um, said to me uh, prior to him coming in, if you can get a shot of me with Peterman, I'll get you a phone, I'll get you a number, I'll get you the case. Like he was ready to throw everything at me. I said, I'll make it happen. And we did, we got the photo of him with the manager and then I made sure to get, to get mine as well. And uh, so that's when I, when I got my first phone. And then I, I have a whole story about this guy in the book. I really admired him and had, had a lot of fun. You might be able to tell by the artwork here who that is. You've seen colors like that. This is Peter Max. And he was in Boston to do the, um, the artwork. He did the poster for the hockey, the NHL All-Star Game. And I got to spend two days following him around to probably about five or six different events, some large, some small. Wherever he was, that's where the party was, though. He was really fabulous, and he taught me a lot as well. And as a matter of fact, he taught me something that, that I used last weekend at, um, there was a, a show called Musicon in Boxborough. And it was all, you know, music people, and I was selling books, and I had photographs. Um, but this is what I learned from Peter. Peter would sit at a table like this at the All-Star Game, at, at the Fan Fest, and he had his posters. And you could come up and say hi to Peter and buy one of his posters for, I think it was about $50. But then if he doodled on it and re-signed the poster, it was an extra 100 and he wanted to sell a lot more of those. So he said to me, Alan, get up on a chair in front of me, probably four feet away, and I want you leaning over and I want you to just fire the camera, just shoot. I said, well, I'm happy to do it, whatever you want, Peter. When do you want me to stop? He said, I don't want you to stop till I tell you. Just fire the flash. I said, what about the role of the film? He said, I don't care about the film. Fire the flash and you'll see what happens. He pulled the posters out. There were a few people. I got on the chair and I started just firing the flash. There was no film. I took about half a dozen photos. Film ran out, rewound it. I just fired the flash every 15 seconds or so. And people came in from the left, from the right. They saw the flash. Then the table grew, and, and all of a sudden there are a lot of people, and now Peter's on. He's signing, he's doodling, what's your name? And he's talking to people, and he's drawing, and he's making 150 bucks every time somebody comes over and talks to him. What I realized was the perception is what's important. The flash didn't matter. He was going to sell these anyways. So at the event last week, I made sure that I had this type of projection. As people walked in, they saw my photos, and I was absolutely channeling Peter at the time. Never forgot what he said. So now, I call this the judges. As I was going through my photos, I realized that a lot of the people that I had shot over the years, 20 year, almost 20 years at, well, sorry, 13 years at KISS concert, 10 years at Oldies, I shot for WBZ, I shot for KISS, uh, for Jammin', ROR, Magic, House of Blues, Hard Rock, at that point in the 90s, this is 92 to 97, let's say, I literally was shooting for every radio station, including WCRB, and I was going down to, to WGBH as well. I was out every weekend shooting music, and people knew me as that photographer. So looking back at this, I found all these judges. So the first ones we're going to look at are from American Idol. Does anybody watch, did you watch any of the music? shows. If not, you may not know all the judges, but you'll certainly recognize the names. This is Paula Abdul at the KISS concert. Now, KISS concert every year would have somewhere between 20 to 35 different acts and all the people that would show up to see the shows as well from sports stars. I remember um, for Winona Judd, Roger Clemens was, was, was backstage meeting Winona. There was always somebody. Steven Tyler showed up. Tom Hamilton showed up. Uh, locally, Mike Wonkum was, was at a lot of the KISS concerts, the weatherman. So, Steven Tyler was a judge as well. This is really early on. This is at uh, the Boston Music Awards at the Orpheum. One of the few times that I was in the front row and wished I wasn't in the front row. I thought I was doing, doing really well. I had my camera all ready to go. The minute the band walked in, the 30 or 40 other photographers were all on top of me. I barely got a shot off. 
I was being knocked around, but I was very pleased with, uh, with this one. This is J-Lo. Again, a KISS concert. And what they were wonderful about, this is when Richie Balsba um, owned the station. The acts were big, small. They had people in, in, in the early parts of their career. Christina Aguilera was there when she was about 15 or 16. Britney Spears at 15, 16. Um, Alicia Keys, about the same age, right at the start of their, their careers. But at those same shows, you would see Rod Stewart, Tom Jones, Carly Simon. I mean, some really big names. Um, uh, Eros, well, it was, it was Peter Wolf. Uh, sorry, um, Peter Wolf did play, but um, i trying to think. You had um, Steven Tyler and Joe Perry played with Run DMC and did Walk This Way, which was phenomenal. This is a very, very young Keith Urban. Um, since this, it's, you know, it's 15, 16 years later, he's had a phenomenal career. But this is really early on. Not a lot of people had heard of him just yet. Talking about big names, Harry, Harry Connick Jr. You know your, you know your, uh, your music celebrities. And one of my favorites, Lionel Richie. Yeah, yeah. I, I also think he's a wonderful judge. He's, he's, uh, he's really good with, with, uh, with people. And then you have what I call the other show, which is The Voice. This is Adam Levine of Maroon 5. Again, this is... Before er, the tattoos. Bef exactly. Bef <laughs> right. Before the tattoos. With Maroon 5, again, uh, Kiss Concert. This is Christina Aguilera at about 16 years old. I have some uh, great shots of her. She was... I mean, and back then she was really pushing it. She could just sing. Shakira. Also early. And I will tell you, she danced and she dances like nobody else. It was hard to focus literally and 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 get the shot. A she moved really fast, but it was so entertaining. I forgot to shoot some of the time. And that's a fact. And this is Alicia Keys. Some big names. There were some really big names at these shows. And this is Usher. Usher was a guest. He had done a show in Boston. And uh, um, a, lot of, a lot of musicians, after their shows in the city, would go to places like the House of Blues. Um, Van Morrison was supposed to go to the house uh, one night, but it was written in the paper. They had written earlier in the day that he was expected to go there. He showed up at the House of Blues, came up the back stairs. You could still smoke back then. It was smoky. There were too many people. He turned around, walked out, walked across the street, and had dinner with Peter Wolf from Jay Giles' band. He never performed, though. And uh, at the Palace, it was the same way. So Usher played there, Nelly, Lil' Kim. These are not people that I was familiar with, but the job was get the photos, and they were great. One of my favorite performers, this is Gwen Stefani and, New D and, and uh, No Doubt. She, was, she didn't just sing on stage, she prowled the stage. She was back and forth, and she really engaged an audience like, like very few that I've seen. And this is Kelly Clarkson. Yep. Well, it's funny that she's a judge on The Voice, but she won American Idol. And this is, sorry? First season. This is the, and this is the first, right. And this is the first season tour. So it was Ryan Starr was one of the people as well, but obviously Kelly was, Kelly was the main attraction. And now I want to share a story. This is one of my favorite stories. This is about Dan Rather and Larry King. And, and why is it my favorite story? Well, one of them, because I introduced the two of them to each other. Okay, so how'd that happen? Well, Dan Rather was um, uh, at Boston University for, um, he had donated his collection of letters and his flak jacket and gas mask. They collect celebrities at Boston University that have some connection to the university. So as, as an example, Martin Luther King Jr. has half of his, his life's works at um, BU and the other half is at Morehouse. So Dan Rather's stuff is at, is at uh, Boston University and it was an earlier in the day event 
and um, we're, we're upstairs and he's talking to the woman that I'm working with, Vita, and he mentions to her that um, he had just filled in for, Dan, for uh, Larry King earlier in the week. And I found out later that that wasn't that unusual, that, that Dan had filled in a few times for Larry, but Dan says he's never met him. And I knew something they didn't know, which was I was working with Larry King that same night. He was in town to get an award from uh, the March of Dimes as Man of the Year. So I knew Larry was there. I just heard Dan hadn't met him and that he'd filled in because Larry had been sick earlier in the week. So the wheels started turning and I know if I can get a shot to the Globe or the Herald, I can make some money. So I'm trying to figure out how this is going to work. And then I hear the best part, which is Dan Rather is going to be at the, the uh, Copley Fairmont Hotel and we're at the Westin, directly across the street. So I asked Dan, I said, if I can get Larry to come over, would you be willing to, you know, to meet him and, and get a shot? And he said, absolutely, he was thrilled. So I have this information, I go to the March of Dimes, I have a, a quiet minute with Larry and I say, Mr. King, um, I worked with Dan, I, just what I told you, I worked with Dan rather earlier in the day, I know that he'd filled in, you haven't met, would you be able to take a few minutes with me and we'll go across the street, with, he's literally across the street, and I'll introduce you. And he said, that'd be fabulous. So we waited until the salad plates came down, Larry wasn't sitting around for that and nobody was looking at us or worrying. He said, let's go. So I'm with my camera in my battery pack and Larry's in, in, in a tux and we're walking across Dartmouth Street, or is it, yeah, Dartmouth, from one hotel to the other. I'm putting my hand to stop the traffic and we get over there and the woman from BU um, who knew that I was coming over, she met us at the door, I called ahead. She met um, Larry and then the three of us went down to the room where Dan was. And this is what happened. It was wonderful just to be the person, you know, to introduce them, not really, I mean, they knew each other, they had talked many times, but they had never met in person. And, and it's a shot like this, there's one more, but this is the shot basically that ran in the paper that put money in my pocket again. But it got even more interesting than that because something I did not know is, and, and Larry King told the story to people at, at the March of Dimes was that on his way into Boston from New York, he was on a private plane and the plane got caught in the tail wash of a jumbo jet. And the plane did a huge nosedive and almost flipped over. He, he was terrified. And he told that story and I had that photo and I called a contact of mine that I thought might be interested and it ran nationally in Us Magazine. And that was my first time being in, in a national publication. And you could see him, he's telling the story of the two planes. So us had been pretty good to me as well after that. There were a few other times that I just, I was in the right place at the right time in Boston. Well, here's, here's me and Larry. At the, at the end of all that, I figured I needed a shot with him as well. Oh, I guess I, guess I don't have the other shots of, uh, from us. I, oh, there's stuff in here, I'm sorry. So I, I think that's, that's pretty, that is my last shot. I mean, you end with Larry King, what's better than that? So thank you for coming. I'd like to know if there are any questions. Not a single question. All right, I'll tell you a story, quick story that happened in Quincy. Did anyone remember Waterworks? Great. So Waterworks had the Bahama Beach Club and I had worked for them a few times and I was there this night because there's a local guy, his name is Neil Burns and he, he does a Steven Tyler, not impersonation, it's a tribute and they're the only band that Aerosmith acknowledges as like they're a real tribute band. Neil looks a lot like him and played it up and they were playing that night. So I was there to, to photograph the, the beach club and, and Neil and uh, the club gets a call as far as I know. This is my version of the story. I heard later it was a little bit different but from where I was standing this is what I heard was that um, Bruce Willis was showing up at the club that night. He was in town, he knew um, it was Liv's birthday I think and he was friends with Steven because of Armageddon so it was plausible that he was there except that earlier in the day it was reported in one of the papers that he'd been down south doing something else and there was very little 
chance of him having been up here to get there that night. But a black um, limo pulls up, about four people get out, and one of them is Bruce Willis. The, the nose, the look, head down, the scruffiness, the whole thing. He walks in, nobody stops him. The manager, they just stay this way and they direct him in. And he goes to the bar and he sits down and people start buying him drinks. He's just sitting there like this. People are around him. I'm down here taking some pictures, and he's just hanging out. Like He didn't say a word. He didn't say he is, he isn't. But everybody is treating him as though he's Bruce Willis. I, at this point, realize, I'm looking at him, I'm like, there's no way. And then he's asked if he would get up on stage. And the guy plays harmonica, like Bruce. And he got up on stage with the fake Steven Tyler and the fake Bruce Willis, and they did, they did a couple of songs, and he was really good. But it was not Bruce Willis, and it was not Steven Tyler, but it was really fun. And that was just down the street. Any questions? We all good? Well, then, thank you so much for being here. My book is available if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if you'd like to take a look at at, at um, the, the, some of the press stuff, please help yourself. <laughs>